morning or good afternoon, folks, from wherever you are. It is a pleasure to be here with you on this Thursday. Um, it's a few days after the time in which we typically uh, reserve, or folks typically reserve to talk about Black people and Black lives during that, those 28 or 29 days of Black History Month. But we uh, at VNR Network, we talk about Black history and Black people year round. And so this is an important opportunity for us to have a conversation that we've uh, deemed with our partners at the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy as hashtag Black Funding 365. I'm going to enter into this conversation with some distinguished and amazing people. Um, you will get to know and hear about them as we have this conversation on how we need to lift up supporting Black-led organizations year round. It should not be episodic. No life should have to be lost for it to happen. We need to do it year round. And I'm going to start by honoring and remembering the words of a great leader, uh, the late Lynn Walker Huntley. She was a past president of Southern Education Foundation and the 13th AppV James A. Joseph lecturer. And she said in this piece, in her 20, 2004 remarks while in Toronto, and I quote, surely you don't think that grant seekers are going to give you philanthropy the kind of critical feedback that you need to improve philanthropic practice. They are too scared that they may never get another grant to tell you the truth. And so that year was actually marking the 50th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. And here we are in America with another racial, racial reckoning. And what we need most importantly at this time is some truth telling. So in the spirit of that, I'm going to introduce to you first, the current president of the South um, Southern Education Foundation, Raymond Pierce, because I want him to offer up some context as it relates to philanthropy and philanthropy's history. Um, it's notable that this organization, Southern Education Foundation, is a 150-year-old organization in this world and has been doing this work for Black people and Black lives for that long period of time. Raymond, good to see you, brother. How you doing, Edward? Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Offer up some history for the people. Well, uh, Edward, um, and I, I appreciate you lifting up um, my predecessor, uh, the late, great Lynn Walker Huntley, uh, and the comments she made, of, yeah, obviously Lynn Walker Huntley had a distinguished career in philanthropy, particularly at the Ford Foundation and at the law also with the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund prior to coming to the Southern Education Foundation as our, as our president um, before her untimely passing. Um, and what Lynn was saying just pretty much captured you know, the history of philanthropy. The Southern Education Foundation was birthed out of the, the philanthropy that came together just before the Civil War and after the Civil War uh, to get Black folks educated, you know, following uh, emancipation. And so th this is nothing new. I mean, think of Frederick Douglass um, and the philanthropists that were supporting the abolitionist movement. And I mean, these were the people who made their wealth um, from uh, the earnings of the South, the banks, you know, the, the shipping industry, um, you know, the textile industries up in Connecticut, you know, these were huge amounts of wealth that were generated from the enslavement, the barbaric act of slavery. And these people were oftentimes conflicted with them. They were oftentimes um, people of faith. Um, and this enslavement of people just conflicted with their Judeo-Christian uh, heritage and, and beliefs. So, uh, you know, philanthropy has always had that conflict. And what Lynn was saying was that, you know, sometimes people don't want to hear the truth because it, it's just the truth hurts. And, and it hurts to tell them that. Um, when we came into being initially in 1867, right after the Civil War, at that time it was the Peabody Fund followed by the Slater Fund. Um, the other funds were funded by, again, philanthropists and some who had supported the abolitionist movement. And there was a large amount of philanthropy pushing to build schools and buy books and train teachers in the South following the Civil War. A lot of it for economic reasons, a lot of it for pure philanthropic, altruistic, uh, and moral reasons. But too often, philanthropy started pulling back. I say sometime right after Reconstruction and in the early 1900s, around 1910, 1912, as we were gaining momentum and, and education and bringing African Americans into the, you know, the full livelihood of citizenship here in the United States, there was an in and out movement um, uh, by philanthropy. Uh, and at some point, 
it was almost an abandonment. All those funds were that you know were originally designed to aid black folks were consolidated into what now is the Southern Education Foundation, and uh, politics started entering into the fray. And uh, you know, it, black folks found themselves on their own many times, and then at times philanthropy would re-enter. And so that kind of disruption, I, I believe, has uh, not allowed to have a consistency where you know addressing the immoralities. Uh, that are the basis of enslavement and capturing the barbaric, you know, barbarism that was all around enslavement. You know, there was not enough consistency in addressing that and reconciling that so much to the point where we still have these issues today. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Thank you for that. I think all too often as, as we have these dialogues and, and so many people are now, uh, I tend to say that, um, you know, having conversations on race is like the new black uh, the idea of us talking about these issues and not recognizing some people really are thinking it's the first time we're having these discussions and we've had them time and time again. And we learn and then we retreat. And we learn some more and then we retreat. And in the spirit of that, as we talk about this work, when we talk about these issues of race and these organizations that matter to us, always um, black led organizations have been at the vanguard of fighting for equity and equal justice for everybody at the yeah. end of the day. Uh, yeah. So I want to bring um, to the stage, if you will, uh, Joya Career Perry, who is the founder and president of the National Birth Equity Collaborative. Hey, Joy. Hey, how's it going? Thank you so uh, much for having me. Thank you for being here. You know, I'm rooting for you and appreciate you <laughs> for everybody. <black. laughs> Everybody's black. <laughs> <laughs> Joy, you do this amazing work. And I know we all had a conversation about the work that you do and, and, and the idea of how you are leading on so much. Um, you know, you've had these conversations and had to, you know, appear before the United Nations because mm -hmm. issues of Black lives and Black life bodies are global mm -hmm. conversations and issues. And so, um, when we talk about these issues of health inequities and as it shows up and as we really have seen on the hills of of um, COVID nineteen, which is still here, still a scourge to Black and Brown bodies, particularly, but really so many people. Um, can you talk about your work and talk about? the necessary impact of your work um, that you're making here in the country and beyond? You know, I would be remiss if I didn't um, bring up what's happening currently right now. Um, just yesterday, the general that represents most physicians as an OBGYN, my field has deeply been colonized by white supremacy. We were used as a, and continue to be used as a tool to advance ideas around eugenics, as a tool around a, um, gender oppression around the globe and in the United States. So we work through research, policy and advocacy, culture shift, doing things like these kind of um, live events with um, amazing organizations like APFI and the National Center for Responsive Philanthropy. So it's important for us to think about how in this context today, yesterday, the um, Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA, released a podcast saying there are no racist physicians. And it's the, you know continuing after we've had multiple conversations after the actual association through the leadership of Dr. Letha Maybank has stated that racism is a public health emergency. You still have people who um, are leaders in the journal in the academic space saying that's not really true. It's really just people's individual choices. So our job and our role is to say no longer are white people's feelings more important than black people's lives. Mm. No more, as Raymond just mentioned, we lean into something and then people's feelings get nervous about change and they get nervous about, well, I'm not racist, you're calling me a name. And then magically all the money and the funding that was going to support the improvement for an upliftment and the undoing and the repairing of the damage that's been caused by 400 to 500 years of a belief of a hierarchy of human value based upon skin color becomes undone. Philanthropy mm -hmm. runs, everybody runs for the hills and we say, oh, well, we don't wanna cause any problems. Let's have a more moderate approach. And that moderate approach is always born out in the lives of black people. Wow, yeah, you said it. Um, I should just warn everyone that there will be a number of mic dropping moments uh, in this conversation and opportunities for folks to think about um, the words of the folks that you're going to hear today. And, and we want to tweet about it. We need to make sure that the public space is flooded with these conversations. And we're talking about these issues in important ways so that it doesn't become something that's episodic. Um, next up, I wanna invite, because of this notion of this work, these issues are global issues. Anana Yamfi, who's the executive director of Black Alliance for Just Immigration, also known as Baji. Nana, those dope glasses, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And clearly, 
Raymond and Dr. Joya have have laid out some things that we need to pay attention to. I'm glad to add to the pepper soup here. I, I love it, the pepper soup, I love it. Um, and so in the space of the work that you do, I mean, again, we're hearing you know, the political landscape for the past you know, dozens of years, this notion of immigrants and how immigrants have been used to really create polarizing wedges amongst um, one side versus the other. And we're forgetting the fact that these are human lives, largely black and brown lives in this space. Uh, can you talk a little bit about why? Because we know that there's been this southern border, you know, really, really demonizing that's going on without recognizing that that border is is actually filled with people that represent the world mm -hmm. in so many different ways and it's often forgotten. Can you talk a little bit more about why black immigrant lives are often ignored in these immigrant rights fights? Yeah, I mean, it's an issue that we face, that we face as Baji and other Black immigrant rights orgs. How do we continue to lift up the concerns of our people in light of the fact that for most policymakers and funders, that all Black people are multi-generational African-American in the United States, and all immigrants are not Black, in particular, are not Black Latinx folks. Part of the issue comes from, you know, it, not so much an ignoring of our ideas, right? Because when we talk about the liberation dream of immigrants, the things that they are pushing now in the immigrant rights movement, these are things that black migrants have been talking about for decades. It's, it's like slowly but surely folks are getting a little closer to catching up with the ideas that we have. And so like other black folks, um, in this country, our ideas are the vanguard ideas. Our energy is the vanguard energy. The songs that people sing, the tactics that people use are the ones that we come up with um, in the immigrant rights movement. And yet, when it comes to getting the funding that we need to build capacity so that we can deal with, you know, and do the work that we're doing at the intersections of racial justice and immigrant rights, we don't get that because a lot of times the look is at numerosity. This is one of the themes of white supremacy, right? White makes right, but also numbers make right, as long as white people want to look at those numbers. And so we're eight to 10% of the foreign born population, but we are 20% of the folks facing deportation when it comes to immigration court. 76% of us, are facing deportation based on criminal grounds, right? Now we're eight to 10%, but 76% facing deportation um, based on criminal grounds. Why? It's because we're black people. And when we're here, whatever we called ourselves back home, we are defined as black and we face that same criminalization. We face the same exclusion and we face the separation of black families and communities that black people have faced um, you know, since the first African was kidnapped and dragged over here um, and forced into slavery. And so as we think about you know, how we look at black immigrants, it's really important that we recognize that connection, right? And it's important for black immigrants to be seen as part of the legacy, right? Um, Harriet Tubman um, is a second generation. She's my son. She just got here <laughs> two, two generations before her grandmother's in the continent. And so we've been here, we continue to be here doing the work um, all the way uh, up until today. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that important reminder. Uh, I also wanted to give acknowledgement to um, the transition of us having um, an ASL interpreter in the room with us in this conversation, um, because it's another conversation that we would definitely wanna continue because we don't often talk about blacks and disabilities either, right, in our society. Uh, the black and disabled is another conversation that we would definitely want to uh, come back to and continue to, to lift up as we continue all of our recognition, all the recognition of black people and how we show up in all the ways that we show up. Um, and so when we talk about what you all have just shared, uh, centered in all this work for better and for worse has been policy, mm -hmm. right? And so what better voice to have than Karundi Williams, who's the executive director of Repower to join us in this dialogue. Uh, since you lifted up Harriet, uh, Nana, so we have her in the room uh, on that wall behind Karundi as well, as, as another beautiful 
uh, black girl with her Afro puffs. So uh, Karundi, uh, thank you for being here with us. Um, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, awesome to have you here. Uh, uh, Nana also made mention of the idea of how our liberation movements, our songs, our chants, our marches, all those things have really become a vital part of so many other movements. People have seen our civil rights work over the years, over the centuries as becoming part of their own cries to fight for their own liberation. And, and sometimes we get the credit, sometimes we don't. But power to the people is a phrase that has been lifted up with black people for a very long time. And so Repower, the work that you're leading, is supporting activism, particularly Black-led act activism in important ways. And because all too often we have an election, and after the election, people will have a sigh of relief and you know just do whatever they need to do. You want to talk about post this, that, or the other thing um, without understanding that the work is just really getting started once those folks are in office. Uh, we're seeing that now with HR1 and then the other the George Floyd bill on um, these ideas of fighting for our justice and our voting rights, which we thought that battle was fought long ago. And here we are once again, acting like it never happened. Um, can you talk about what we need philanthropy to start really moving towards? You talk about the work that you're doing, then also talk about the work that we need philanthropy to start doing once we get past this last very volatile election cycle. Absolutely. And I'm so excited to join this esteemed panel to discuss this today. You know, my organization is one that is really invested in building capacity and power inside of BIPOC-led communities. And for us, too often, philanthropy and other uh, elected officials and folks that are running for election and elected office have a very extractive and uh, transactional relationship with black communities and other communities of color. And we're pretty much done with that as well. We have got the receipts, we can show you the receipts. And for us, we wanna cash in on what we have been doing and investing in leading this country and moving this country towards a really uh, a democracy that is quite unfinished. And black folks and other people of color and other communities of color has been the backbone so often that has helped to deliver for this country and it is time for us to move towards less of transactional relationship and really one of transformation. So as we reflect on this last election, what we've often seen is a lot of investments in communities of color during electoral cycles. And when that election is delivered, again, we're in this like extractive relationship with a lot of these powers that be, frankly. And so once we deliver our end of the bargain, which is often delivering this country in a successful way to move it forward, we see folks retract. We see those investments retract. We have had this conversation about capacity building and infrastructure and why that's important. But oftentimes, philanthropy and other powers that be only see that as important in those cycles. Now we're in 2021 and we're having the same conversation, which is this a lot of investment during a cycle and then this, this, this sort of retraction when it is time to hold them accountable frankly. And so as we get into 2021 and we get into these legislative cycles, a lot of these electeds owe these communities, you know, their office. And I, I you know, I don't want to get too into politics here. It's about really pushing on those that frankly owe us a debt of gratitude, pushing on them for them to be able to deliver on the promises that they make to our communities and, and, and frankly cash in right on what we have been able to do for them so for my organization we are an organization that invests year-round as your hashtag says we invest 365 days of the year not just from electoral cycles to electoral cycle and philanthropy needs to have that same type of energy investment is required year-round not on these electoral cycles yeah yeah thank you for that thank you and, and for calling out what you know some people thought it may be a slip of the tongue but when you say um, the the impact or or the at the the adversarial responses to progress, um, some people may call it backlash, but the reality in this space is really blacklash, right? Exactly. The idea that it's it's very targeted towards people, towards our, us, our people who have been uh, moving, bootstrapping, uh, as they used to call it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Really working hard to make uh, you know a dollar. I think Nana, you made a statement before you make you know you get five dollars out of fifteen cents. You know, I was like the idea we need there's inflation. We need more support to do this work. And 
And I want to come back because, you know, your organizations, you know, comparatively speaking, you know, AFI, even at 50, we're babies compared to the Southern Education Foundation, right? Um, NAACP is a baby compared to the to the work of the Southern Education Foundation. And, and I really need to know, uh, we need to know, you know, what has really helped keep the organization alive, and not just alive, uh, Brother Pierce, but thriving in the space that we know that it's the, Folks' funding is episodic. They get kind of janky in all reality. Um, you know, another shiny new penny gets on the horizon and philanthropy is totally forgotten about what they've been fighting for like the last 150 years, like public education. Can you talk a little bit about what's kept you all moving and thriving? You're on mute, brother. Thank you. What has kept us alive? During those years when philanthropy pulls out, black folk, <laughs> black folk, bottom line. When philanthropy engaged, um, you know, the newly emancipated population, you know, when the, when the dust settled after the Civil War, um, black folks had already been setting up what we call field schools. We were setting up churches and we were also setting up field schools out in the woods. Even before, even during the war, even before the war, black folks were finding, getting behind the barn somewhere, getting out in the woods with a piece of paper teaching each other how to read. And so when the war ended, they, black folks moved quickly because education, learning how to read and write was so critical. And so we were setting up all these schools ourselves. We were pulling pieces of paper together ourselves. When the Peabody Fund came in in 1867 and started putting in a lot of money, you know, buying books and training teachers and building schools and so forth and so on, followed by the Slater Fund, uh, followed by the Jeans Fund. Of course, all those funds were eventually consolidated to form the Southern Education Foundation in, in the 30s when philanthropy was getting to pull out, I think for the second or third time uh, during these cycles. Black folks were already, had, had already built up a lot of these institutions. A lot of these today, historically black colleges and universities came out of that movement. Many were created by philanthropy like Tuskegee and Hampton. Many were created just by black folks, period. Uh, Clark Atlanta and others in Jackson State. But it was black folks that were putting these things together. And so when philanthropy started pulling out, those times philanthropy pulled out, thank God we had, you know, strong black people like Mary McLeod Bethune and, and, and Dr. Harrison and, and Samuel Mays and folks like that who, you know, were carrying the torch that their forefathers came. We can do more when philanthropy does its part. And I say that seriously, it does its part. But um, let me give you an example real quick. Mm -hmm. When reconstruction was going on, and the federal troops were here in the South. And philanthropy, white philanthropy was paying for all of this, paying for the books, paying to build the schools, the Rosenwald schools, the Sears Roebuck empire was putting a lot of money in the South. Again, a consciousness, we gotta do something. Here. The number one thing that philanthropy said back then, this is 1869 folks, was we can't keep paying for this. You have to find a way to sustain this. Sounds familiar, right? Yeah. We can't keep paying for this. You have to find a way to sustain this. This was being said in 1869, people. And so you black folks have to do in the South what white folks in the North did. You got to raise taxes to pay for all this. So white folks drafted the legislation, but it was black elected officials protected by the Southern, the Northern Army going down to the state houses in Alabama and Mississippi and Kentucky and North South Carolina, Maryland, Virginia, wherever, and introducing legislation to pay for taxes, not just for the roads and bridges, but for schools, for public education, to sustain that philanthropy. Yeah. When the troops pulled out, the very first thing the white the white gentry in the South wanted to do was quash that. It was white, poor whites that rose up and said, hey, wait a minute, now nah, let's keep it, let's just keep it separated. Black taxes go to support black schools, white taxes go to support white schools. It was the Slater Fund, white philanthropists said, wait a minute. We're paying to try to get your universities up and running because back then, white philanthropy in the North thought, okay, if we can get these white folks in the South educated, they'll turn from their barbaric ways of enslaving people. So let's put money in the University of Georgia and the University of North Carolina. That's how the University of North Carolina got strong, the University of Virginia. Let's put money in that. And what did the white philanthropists say back then? Look, we will stop funding those universities if you segregate these funds. They did it, they stood up because black folks were screaming and hollering. But what happened 15, 20 years later? 
they eventually got segregated anyway. Philanthropy got quiet, they pulled out. That's the harm in this in and out thing, you know? And so who, who had to step in? Southern Education Foundation, by then the funds had been consolidated. We had to bankroll Thurgood Marshall's research and Jack Greenberg and all those guys to do the research to get ready for Brown v. Board of Education. And no philanthropy will help back then. No philanthropy helped like that. I think by 1934, one philanthropy showed up, the Ford Foundation gave a grant $50,000. No university would pick it up. We brought that in also to do the work to get their good information he needed to win in Brown v. Board of Education. It's nothing new. It's nothing new. It's time after time after time. Wow. You know, they, they, you know there's a biblical saying around there's nothing new under the sun. Um, but sometimes those of us in these spaces tend to just forget that. Um, the, the, the tricks, the, the, I use some old quote church, the tricks of the devil, they have been used oftentimes. And sometimes it's a new, it's just a new person playing the game, right? Oftentimes, Amen. The same thing that's happening. Um, and to that point though, um, because this conversation is really centered on the idea of us really getting resources to the people that need, that are doing the work. Not just because again, we've lost another black life and some people feel sorry for that uh, tragedy uh, and they're only gonna feel sorry just you know for a news cycle at best sometimes. Um, we know that there have been some folks that have really been in this work that have been moving, making a difference, that are working on the front lines. And so I would love to hear from you all, who is inspiring you? Who is really out there in the field, even in, in philanthropy and beyond, who's out here in the field that are really investing time, talent, treasure, testimony, whatever they can to help move this work that you see? Besides you all, because you all, are, I, know, I know you're doing the work, who are some other voices that are that really kind of inspire you in this space and have supported you even, you can even lift that up? Um, I can take a stab at it. Uh, so I would love to talk about my mentor, Dr. Kamara Jones. Mm -hmm. um, she has really led the way for many of us who are physicians to really talk about racism. Um, I, you know, I tell people all the time, I was taught in medical school that there were three biological races, mongoloid, caucasoid, and negroid, and that was in the 1990s. So this is not some historical long time ago, those schools that Raymond was just mentioning, I went to LSU for medical school. And although we org I was an organizer back then and organized to get my embryology professor fired for saying that, um, the truth is until we had a Kamara Jones who could talk to and be the president of the American Public Health Association and create frameworks inside of the context around teaching racism in public health, around talking about the definition that we be where we are today in the field. So I'm hopeful and optimistic that we won't continue to go backwards when we have real scholarship and leadership and research showing that racism, not race, is what's killing us inside of our healthcare system. Wow, oh, thank you. We quote uh, Dr. Jones often. We do racial equity work at APFI, and, and we tend to quote her because she's she has really been moving, and it, it resonates with folks. Folks in the health sector, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse, have been understanding the idea of the importance, for example, of disaggregating data, mm -hmm. and getting beyond some very easy ways to say it's you know being very simplistic in how we want to define people and understanding even in this conversation. The folks that are so long, you can easily call us black, but if you dig deeper, you know we're more than just black, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that's important. Who else? Karundi, I see you smile. I think you're ready to say something. Yeah, um, I would actually like to lift up a lot of the leaders of color that are within a collaborative that I'm a part of who are now leading a lot of national progressive organizations that were formerly white led. And I just want to say, I've been in my role at Repower for the past 18 months as the first black woman to lead that organization, um, who, which has a 17 year history. And a lot of my colleagues who are newly elect, um, newly executive directors of a lot of these national progressive organizations are stepping into those leadership roles after they've been left by you know, other white folks. And frankly, all of us are leading organizations um, that are now doing it differently, right? We're all leaning into talking about race. We're all leaning into really fully invested in communities of color. There is a consortium of us, we're called the, the EDs of Color Colla uh, Collective, and it's made up of groups like State Voices, BISC, um, the National uh, Working Families Party, um, the State Innovative Exchange. 
uh, folks that I can't list right now move on. A lot of us are all stepping into these roles as national leaders and we are shifting the energy and being unapologetic, frankly, about it, about us moving and investing and calling in philanthropy to partner with us in a way that is investing fully, deeply, and 365 in these communities of color. When I look at next, last year, we came together and looked at the amount of impact that we had as a collective across this country, and we, our organizations, really delivered this election um, for us right now to be feeling a lot of weight lifted off our shoulders that we've been able to move forward. So I really wanna give um, a lot of uh, kudos to these uh, leaders who are stepping into these roles. And frankly, we are having conversations with philanthropy that is very similar. Us going to philanthropy and saying, hey, listen, our organizations were funded at a different level when it was white led. We're now asking and frankly begging for you to fund us at the same level, and, a lot, and often our conversations about folks are, you know, again, contracting, going within, and not really doubling down, and that's what we're calling on philanthropy to do, is really double down on its investments in our organization so we can continue to move this country forward. And within philanthropy, I would say, I would say, you know, Ford, you asked this, this example of folks that are doing it right. The Ford Foundation for me has really stepped up and supported my organization in a way that has allowed me to really um, get the support without asking me to jump through all types of hoops. Frankly, they have been giving me that support I need to continue to move this work forward and to continue building my organization. So that is one um, one uh, example of philanthropy doing it well, and they need to continue doing that, and other others need to follow their lead. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Nana, did you have some thoughts on that too? You know I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think when it comes to movement folks, I'm not gonna single out people because I, I would be remiss, too many. Um, yeah. folks that I'm looking up to and that we're working with. I mean, I'll give the shout out to black immigrant leaders in particular, black immigrant women, black immigrant queer folks, black immigrant trans folks who are really putting shoulder to the wheel to do this work at that intersection of racial justice and immigrant rights. So in both of those worlds and other worlds, um, other justice issues that come up. And I, I will lift up Generation X in that crew because we are the oft ignored um, people who kept moving through the war on drugs and through attacks on our home countries and just an intense time when philanthropy wasn't thinking about us and wasn't funding anything that we did. We did a lot of free labor, free work and continue to do that. And the ultimate shout out is to the people because that's who the power is with and you know, every day I am inspired by the work that our folks on the ground, particularly those who are most directly impacted, um, are doing on a daily basis, not just to survive and thrive, but really um, proving true that we are the ones that keep us safe and we are the ones that do for us. As um, my, my colleagues have mentioned um, in this webinar, I think when we look at philanthropy, there are no like superstars from our perspective. There are definitely people who are doing better than others. We're glad that folks are focusing on black folks um, that in what they describe as this racial reckoning, they're looking at even in the world of black immigrants, you know, what is it that we can do? We see these numbers in terms of the criminalization, the deportation, the exclusion, what can we do? And so that's been helpful. And those um, funders, those philanthropists that have looked at that and have stepped up, we definitely appreciate that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we know that there is some falling short that is happening in a couple of ways. When I look at Baji's budget, I know of too many organizations with half as many people with the same budget that we have or a bigger budget. Mm -hmm. That's unreasonable. Like these mm -hmm. other organizations are not dealing at the intersection of racial justice and immigrant rights. They frankly have half or a third of the work that we have as black immigrant organization mm -hmm. doing the work both on the ground and um, with policy. 
And, you know, so we need for, again, for the investment into this liberation ritual, as I like to refer to it, right? Ritual requires sacrifice. Yeah. Philanthropy is making a lot of money off of the sacrifice, including labor of black folks, including black immigrants and black folks you know, in our home country. And so we expect that there will be more sacrifice that is made in this liberation ritual, both here in the United States and beyond, um, but certainly keeping this to a U.S. conversation. And that sacrifice really needs to be made without trying to be the organizers. I think that there are enough philanthropists that have heard the words of the great black immigrant women, Audre Lorde, um, talking about, you know, all of the ways that we can be free at all the intersections that we, you know, they've heard, for example, the abolition conversations of the great black immigrant women, Andrea Ritchie and Maria Macaba, and they can repeat those words. And so now they think they know how to do the work and they try to tell us how we should be doing the work. And really, we need them to listen. We know how to do this work. What we need is for them to put in their sacrifice, their part of this liberation ritual, so that we can make this liberation happen. And it happens easiest, and I'll end here, when we also see, our, see ourselves in philanthropy. Mm -hmm. We need people at our intersections, Black people at all intersections in decision-making spaces as program officers that's how we create that transformative relationship that was described earlier. Well, I, you know, you've teed me up, cued me up so perfectly for my next question, but I wanted to make sure, Raymond, uh, Brother Pierce, did you have any thoughts on that around folks well, that you I, yeah, I would have to, I, I totally understand what uh, Nana is saying, and um, I don't want to be, I don't, if you mention somebody, you'll, you'll forget somebody. <laughs> um, but I've got to lift up Reverend William Barber. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that brother, and um, the way he continues to press upon um, that which is right, mm -hmm. uh, that which any human being can understand is moral, um, and push that, uh, you know, for 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 righteousness, um, and, but while understanding, as as Dr. King understood in his readings of Ryan Holt Niebuhr and other theologians, I, I consider myself a black theologian that um you know the morality of humankind can never be trusted because of self-interest therefore you have to build black economic power you have to build black political power uh, so you know doc, i mean the dr reverend william barber bishop barber and the way he continues to push that particularly upon for the least of those uh, the mm -hmm. political campaign mm -hmm. i i just love that brother for that mm -hmm. secondly i've got to lift up in the philanthropic world uh darren walker i mean I have darren's book on my desk right now Mm -hmm. You know, a new gospel of wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, and that brother calls it the way it is. Mm -hmm. And in the seat he sits in, for him to be so honest in what he's saying, uh, it, it inspires me. Wow. Oh, thank you for that. And I, I know it's just like at the birthday party when, you know, you want to thank folks and then like, folks get mad afterwards at the reception. Why didn't you say me? You know, listen, Edward, I have to. If we're going to do, I didn't do philanthropy. So I have to do Dwayne if I'm going to do <laughs> philanthropy. Because I know who's probably watching, but Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is deeply invested in in, in bank. So thank y'all. <laughs> <laughs> shout out, shout out. No, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. But knowing that you all are here, um, the folks that have helped and inspired you along the way should understand that your, your presence is the thank you. Uh, they should feel just appreciative right. of knowing that you are still lifting them up, whether you say their name today or tomorrow or not. Uh, that's such an important part of this work. And I think what uh, it prompts this this thought around how we get to these spaces. Um, you all talked a little bit about the resources that you had, and how you've done what you've done. And what we know to be true is oftentimes that philanthropy and others push us to have to make a decision. You know, it's this versus that. You know, is it black lives versus brown lives versus all lives? Is it men versus women versus black children versus brown children versus immigrants versus you know, we, we get into these whole things when we, when we forget the fact that, you know, all lives really should matter. And if they all matter, then we wouldn't be having these conversations, right? Um, so can we talk a little bit about this notion of how you all um, see the issues of intersection, intersectionality? Uh, Nani, you had, were talking about it, so that was kind of what was prompting me to really want to lift this up. 
as we talk about trans lives and, and LGBTQ lives and, and women and women's health versus men. Can we talk a little bit about this notion of intersectionality and why it's important to really be thoughtful around uh, looking at our intersections and supporting us as we are? Yeah, so I mean, I think, first of all, really important for people to read what the great black woman, Kimberly Crenshaw, says about intersectionality, because everything is becoming intersectionality now. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to what I said earlier, we, you know, people pick up these buzzwords and then they run with them. Next thing you know, you can barely recognize them. But really, it's about how are we impacted in the different spaces that we live in, right? Um, which don't separate us out. I am black. I am a woman. I am, uh, you know, an immigrant or a child of immigrants. Uh, all of that impacts me, right? The education I have, everything. It presents me and puts me in certain spaces. Um, and people might assume and try to focus on the spaces of privilege, but it's like, where actually are the spaces in which we are impacted by white supremacy, anti-blackness, heteronormativity, et cetera? class, right, capitalism, etc. And so I think, you know, for us with Baji, this is what we do. We really intentionally focus on the um, an acknowledgement that Black folks are living in these intersections and that it's important for us to focus on, in particular, people that are in the most directly impacted by all of those isms and descriptions that I gave um, mm -hmm. in our community. And it, again, this is based on what we were taught by black women, black queer folks, black trans folks about how when all of us are free, when black people are free, excuse me, all of us will be free, right? That Fannie Lou Hamer taught us, that great mama, that you cannot be free unless I am free, right? And so it's almost like someone said, if you want freedom, eat bread, right? That you want, if you want freedom, focus on black folks. And then people make these big dinners with no bread at the table, or the bread is like decoration on the ceilings or whatever on the side, but people are not doing what's needed to be done. And so if we're intentional about treating people at their intersections, thinking about people at their intersections, assisting and supporting people at their intersections with the liberation praxis, in particular a black liberation praxis, that's how we're gonna get free. If we do not do that, we will remain in bondage. Just that mm -hmm. simple. Mm -hmm. And Donna, I just, because I get to work a lot with Kimberly and I'm always blessed and honored when she Drop some wisdom on me. She, we're we're on calls, and I'm always like, "Oh, this woman. This is the reason why she's the founder of a whole train of, of work." And um, but she, if you're reminded as to how she had to start, right? Like this idea that one identity is all that matters, and if you're going to check off a box for say something like affirmative action, is how you have white women be open represented and have so much more access due to affirmative action. Until we can identify that we have multiple intersections of oppression. That's the word that we leave out in that conversation, right? Our identities are not just things that exist, right? So when I hear people using intersectionality and they say, well, what am I bringing besides being a woman? Um, I'm middle class, I'm heteronormative, I'm you know, cisgender. Like, well, what is your other identity that's oppressing you? What's causing you to have harm? So that is Absolutely. what I find in my field is missing, especially as philanthropy mm -hmm. wants to invest in intersectionality. And uh, many white feminists are now magically intersectional because feminism is getting a bad rap or they don't like the way that's being seen in the in the community and intersectionality is now what's sexy. Um, and so they're using the word intersectionality. I say, okay, well, come on, sis, what's your other, what's the other thing that's harming you? What are you working on? Because I know I can see Nana's um, immigration. I know immigration is a struggle, right? That's real. I know that being um, a black man is a struggle. That's real. So tell me what the other identity that you have that's causing you to be oppressed. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. I love this conversation. Um, at our organization, uh, we believe in inclusive politics. And for us, that means intersectionality, right? That is, and, and, and I, I, I would be remiss without saying, white supremacy culture want us to play oppression Olympics. Mm -hmm. They want us to separate. They understand that if we, as the folks they have othered, come together that our collective power has the ability to undo white supremacy, right? Yes, so when yes. we saw what happened on the Capitol, that was white supremacy acting up 
because they saw the power that we had collectively. We delivered the selection because communities of color came together and the for other people that they othered. So, you know, gender non-conforming folks, trans folks, all of us came together collectively and we started loosening the grip that white supremacy has on power. And we saw them acting up, right? So they do want us to continue playing a oppression Olympics. And at my organization, we center people of color. We have a specific emphasis on women of color, but it's not to the exclusion of folks that are Latinx, uh, gender non-conforming folks. We center gender, we center race. And my organization internally, we talk about it all the time. Within our own culture and our organization's cultural values, we talk about centering race and starting with race, but not to the exclusion of all the others and the other isms that my esteemed colleagues have talked about. So I just, I love this, like, I love this, like, how people have taken the word intersection, intersectionality and started doing all this extra shit with it. But really what it means is they want us to separate. And what we really need to think about is everybody that has been othered in this country need to come together. And that collective power can really finally loosen the group that white supremacy has on power. Yeah, the, the, the one of the untold stories that um needs to be told and retold again really is centered on the work of the, the the reverend william barber as raymond pierce talked about the work of king and his the network to address these issues of the poor people's campaign um, before he died could not be should not be taken lightly and even as reverend barber is doing this work and mobilizing a multi-racial multi-identity multi-regional is this all the multis uh coalition of folks talking about the idea of, of of poverty doesn't have any particular demo, fit any particular demographic. You know, the idea of oppression and, and injustice, it's not limited to any one demographic. And, and it's definitely not something to be blamed on happening in the South. George Floyd was not in the South when he was murdered, right? The idea that we want to think that these things can be isolated or compartmentalized does not serve us well at all. And so I want to invite you, um, Brother Pierce, to talk a little bit more about um, this idea of the work in the South. And because a lot of times people say, you know, so goes the South, so goes the nation in a lot of ways. And, and we saw some major shifts this last November That's right. in the South, particularly in Georgia. And it's got some folks scurred, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? There's so talk much there. The work in the South. Yeah, talk about that. There's so much there, uh, Brother Jones. You're so right. Um, America has a consciousness, particularly white America, particularly white liberal America uh, has a consciousness that the, their demons on this issue of race lie in the South. Um, and that that's where it all is. So when a George Floyd um, gets killed as far north as you can get, you know, uh, up in Minnesota, um, then uh, that kind of rattles folks, you know, that, that, that kind of rattles folks. And it scares, um, I think, those white supremacists who figure they only have to defend the front in the South. That, wait a minute, you know, uh, you know, our brothers, our white supremacist brothers and sisters also are throughout this whole country, which we know they all, they've always been. So, um, you know, and that whole issue of intersectionality, let's not, let's not forget, which I think you just you know, brought back in, you know, the intersectionality of income, of economics, of rate, of, of poverty, you know, and, and, and how that needs to be included in this also, because when you bring everybody in, you realize, you know, race knows, I mean, poverty knows no race. It knows no gender. It, it, it hits everybody. It hits, it hits us disproportionately, but it hits everybody. So this notion of, um, of, of geographic uh, focus goes back to the, again, the war, you know, this whole this whole tension in, in white America that, OK, you all in the southern states, you all deriving your income from this barbaric act of slavery. We in the north, we don't do that, um, but we'll bank your money. You know, we'll bank the money. You know, we'll we'll lease and insure the ships that, you know, that take the money. You know, we'll pay for the ovens that refine the, you know, the sugar. We'll do that, but we're not going to get our hands in, in that barbaric work that you have going on down there in the South. That's got to be dissipated. 
because this thing, you know, this 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 dehumanizing uh, that went on that some people in America just do not want to come to grips with that they actually did this, that they actually kidnapped people and enslaved them and bred them like cattle, that this thing was not just in the South. This was global. This was national. This was the United States of America. Mm -hmm. So yes, we may have Southern in our name because the funds came here, but we've been, you know, the diaspora that followed the great migration in the 30s and 40s and the 20s, uh, the Southern Education Foundation has been involved in New York and Baltimore and Cleveland and places like that because the black people we were supporting migrated up there. Mm -hmm. So yes, you know, um, let's 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 be real about this. This is not a southern problem. And I'll note this. I'll note this also. What region of the country receives the least amount of philanthropic support? The South. <laughs> Why? <laughs> uh, I see Dr. Joy nodding her head. Why? Uh, there's still that belief for white philanthropy that those are the barbaric white folks down there. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have to get involved with them. We'll do everything up north. Look, you know, the guilt goes all around. Why do you think Brown University in Rhode Island <laughs> took the step they did? They made millions of dollars, millions of dollars off of that transatlantic trade. The sugar cane to enslave black folks were chopping down Louisiana and, and the Caribbean. You know, they that was refined up in Rhode Island, <laughs> okay, and shipped down to Portugal. It was just a huge, you know, I mean, uh, you know, the 1619 project reveals it all, but it is not, it is not just you know, constrained to the South. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Never well, has. Been. You're absolutely right, uh, and that's the a truth that is also need to be told in this space. In this space, um, I saw you come off. Uh, from you, Nana, did you have a thought about that? Yeah, just to add that, you know, we also cannot, when we think about the, um, the, the electoral work that was done and the victories that were won, we also need to remember that, you know, sisters led that. Um, you know, it was sisters who were in the front of that, including my black immigrant sister friend in say a foot, ED of New Georgia project, right? But we can't forget that sisters led that. And so as we talk about King and as we talk about Reverend Barber, and we should, we cannot forget Ella Baker. We cannot forget Fannie Lou Hamer. We cannot forget Kwame Touré. We cannot, you know, from Trinidad, also known as Stokely Carmichael. We cannot forget, um, you know, folks like Stacey Abrams and say, oh, foot, like we, you know, black women, black migrants have been in that space as well. And finally, with this electoral win, Yes, everyone came together and followed the lead of Black women with yeah. the Black liberation praxis. Yeah. If we did that with everything, we done been freed already. All right, now, done been freed. Uh, I think, so appreciate you lifting that up and, and thinking about, you know, I saw somewhere where, where someone had made a, a statement that said, maybe they should have let Stacey Abrams become the governor. Um, because they didn't realize that she that title was not the title that she needed to make a difference, right? She she moved mountains in that way and shouting out to people like Latasha Brown and Cliff Albright and all these other amazing people in our spaces that are doing work from where they are. And I think this is a good time to ask you all two things. One is the idea of the the, the imperatives that we need. We need funders, family, friends, all the Fs to do some work, right? We need everyone to step into these spaces. And so uh, could you all kind of wrap up as we're getting ready to close with guidance for your families and friends and the funders, what they need to do? I invite all of you to share that. What do you, what is the imperative you need to give your family, friends and funders to do to really affect the change that we need to get more black organizations funded to do the work that we need them to do for this country and this world? Well, I just want to build on what Nana said about investing in Black women. I do think that there is a strong reason why you see that the Black women led the work in the South and for the um, and for the liberation of the country and the world to make sure that we won Georgia, because we don't fear. We have we have no place for fear. We don't have time for fear. When your first notion, especially because of white supremacy, is to hold on to patriarchy and to hold on and what we're worried about what the anti's are going to say or we're worried about what white folks are going to say, we don't need you to be in leadership. Invest in the people who know worrying about what the anti's are going to do or worrying about what white folks are going to say is not going to get us to freedom. 
Fannie Lou Hamer and all of the elders that we mentioned today, they weren't scared. They weren't afraid of what's going to happen, what white folks are going to say. They were more afraid of what we don't what we don't have if we don't fight for freedom. So fight for that. Invest in that. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I, and I would also be remiss without saying yes support black women. Um, you know, when I thought, I thought a lot about um, what has happened in the past few years and the Malcolm X quote always comes up for me that the most disrespected person in America is the black woman and continues to be the black woman. When I think of Breonna Taylor, that hit home for me every single time I think about her as the most, um, the, the, we are the group that continues to save America and yet we continue to be disrespected by this country. So I, I have, I, I just had to add that too, that that continues to be true. But to your questions about family and friends and philanthropy, for me, this election and this last cycle, and I, frankly, since 2016, we have seen a lot of people get involved in a way that we haven't seen um, in the past. And my call to action there would be stay involved. Repower is the organization that invests in the leadership of people of color with a special focus on women of color. A lot of these black women, brown women, we're all out here doing the work and doing the fight. And we wanna continue investing in their leadership so we can have see the next Stacey Abrams and the next Ense Umfuts, all of the wonderful, amazing women of color, black women leaders, we invest in them year round. And that is one of the things I wanna say. So folks that are involved, stay involved because the cyclical shit needs to stop. And we need to make sure that we're continuing to invest in these leaders and activists as they move forward and continue to help move this country forward. And to philanthropy, my call to action for philanthropy and anyone who's listening today is double your investment in black led organizations mm -hmm. to fund us at the same or a lesser amount than our white predecessors is disrespectful. It is disrespectful and it needs to stop. Double your funding. That is my call for philanthropy. We are out here doing the work. We need your investment and we need you to double your investment as a baseline. That would be my call to action today. I, 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 would, I would double that, um, uh, which was just said, double the philanthropy support for black led social justice organizations. I mean, the, the, the scourge of this country right now, everything we're seeing right now in this country you know, everything that's coming apart, everything we saw on January 6th is because in large part because this country has not dealt with what some folks call this original sin and how it has treated black people. So double your effort there. Listen to black people. Listen to black people. Black people want the same thing anybody else wants. And so let's go about removing the systemic pieces of this system that continue to oppress our folks. And so I, I just continue to repeat what everything else has been said before me. I would just add that, you know, one of the things that our great leader and teacher, Maria Makaba, talks about is that you cannot hold people accountable. People have to hold themselves accountable. So with respect to philanthropy, we can direct philanthropy. We can, we can do what we're doing today and share information and let you know what it is that we need, how it is that we need it, how much more we need, I would say triple um, in this case. But what we can't do because of the power relationship is make you accountable beyond persuasion. You know, my mother used to say this thing to us when she was trying to get us to do something. She used to say, when persuasion fails, use force <laughs> right and the reality is that force takes us out of the world that that, that nana loves to live in which is the abolitionist world right mm -hmm. where we're holding each other we're, we're holding ourselves accountable recognizing acknowledging the harms that we've caused figuring out how we're going to do better that's what i'm we're asking philanthropy to do because we don't want to have to make demands and be angry and push and press and prod this is again the obligation that philanthropy has in this liberation ritual and so if you're committed to liberation you must commit to black led organizations and black led organizing which means that you've got to commit at the level of our need at the level of our imagination at the level of our creativity and that that it needs to happen immediately right this the, the, the gathering of funds that, that has occurred 
has occurred again on the backs of black people and certainly the the uh, the funding of the black future that we're looking for which is a future in which all people have human rights and human dignity is one that philanthropy needs to invest in well said yeah, absolutely i heard it once said fund us like you want us to win at the end of the day right uh, ashley woodard henderson i think said that Thank you all for this important conversation. Uh, it's definitely not the last one. Uh, it can't be the last one. Um, my brother, my sisters, uh, you all are doing the work and you know you are doing the work that so many others are also doing that may not be on this panel, but are all but are in these streets and are making a change. And so those that have heard the sounds of your voices should heed the words that you've given because these are the words that should be in tomorrow's textbooks. So people understand this is how we got to the victories that we know we want to achieve. So thank you all. Thanks to our partners at the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy. Thanks to the Black women that run the organization I work for, uh, including <laughs> Susan Peter Batten and our board chair, Karen McNeil Miller. Uh, thanks AFI's members. Um, thanks all of, all of you all for the work that you do. I know that the work is not over because we definitely need to be funding Black. And Black funding 365 is going to matter if we really all want to see liberation. So. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for participating. God bless you, and we will see you again. Well done. Well, well done. What a pleasure. Thank you.